Hello, my name is Elder Price, and I would like to share with you the most amazing book. Hello, my name is Keith. <laughs> you want me to serve cunt? Tonight? I don't want to talk <laughs> Other things Oh things my god Though it's a I am a girl I am a teenage girl Only 23 years old I am not perfect Walgreens has trans masks, but where are the trans femmes? I don't want to lose you, girl. I'm not a girl. You're the smartest girl in the world. I'm not a girl. But girl. Not a girl. And I think I love you too, girl. I'm not a girl. Body of a white lady. Not, not, a, lady. not a lady, darling. I love you, girl. Oh my god, people's depression gets so bad they can't brush their teeth? People's depression gets so bad they kill themselves, Shannon. Lesbian culture is, is it a date? Are we hanging out? Are we gals being pals? Are we historical roommates? Or do we have feelings? Or are we friends? I don't know and I never- <gasps> Okay. I knew I like... smelt a conservative. <laughs> A win is a win. A win is a win. I don't care what y'all say. A win is a win. Are y'all ever with a cis person and then they just randomly like compliment themselves? They're like, oh, well, I, um, I actually forgot their dead name. So, girl, I did not bake any cookies today. I don't know what you want from me here. So I found out that a lot of the trans kids at my school are finding my TikTok, which is really cool and interesting, and it's totally fine that they're doing that. But I do have a message for you if you're one of my students and you're watching this right now. And that message is if you ever come to school to talk about one of my TikToks and your homework isn't done, I swear. A win is a win. <laughs> a win is a win. I don't care what y'all say. A win is a win. Okay, I'm not even being funny anymore, but can we please get a Google Maps specifically for gay miles per hour? Because you can't make this shit up. Google Maps, the heteronormative Google Maps, said that I would be at one place within 10 minutes. No, it took me just a three minute Taylor Swift song to get there. No problem! <laughs> it's not our fault that heterosexuals are so fucking slow. Is that petition warranted for gay Google Maps? I think so. Sometimes I worry that because when I lived with my mother I was presenting as a boy, I missed out on some of the classic mother-daughter relationship dynamics, but the last time that I went to visit home, she told me that when I tie my hair up, you can tell that I was raised as a boy, and with that single passing offhanded comment, she has fully destroyed my self-confidence and given me a new insecurity. And if that is not a classic mother-daughter interaction, I don't know what is. 
My girlfriend just got sent a bouquet of flowers from a man that she works with. Granted, normally that would sound weird. However, in this case, this is the funniest thing I have ever seen in my life. Let me show you why. My girlfriend works in the film industry and she was helping out a grip with some scheduling issues and he handmade her this bouquet. But the note, however, is what makes this golden. This note. These are the first flowers I've ever bought for a lesbian that wasn't an apology for trying to turn them when I was drunk. <laughs> This is the most clumsy yet self-aware note I've ever seen in my life, so kudos to you. I think we have a Jon Stewart redemption arc on transgender people, y'all. Jon Stewart just came out with one of the most powerful defenses of trans rights, and he just absolutely demolishes all of the turf and anti-trans arguments and anti-trans laws that have been going on all this year, and... Oh my God, you just gotta watch these clips. Ah yes, the gender wars. Anti-trans legislation increased 800%. What, did trans people storm the Capitol? 98% of the young people who have gender dysphoria are able to move past that wow. without uh, that medical treatment. That's, an, that's and so an incredibly made up figure. This is harder than I have ever seen any celebrity go on trans rights. And you've got to watch his takedown of Arkansas AG Rutledge and her law that will detransition all trans teens in Arkansas. It's incredible. You just got to go watch it. It's called The Problem with Jon Stewart. What's up, gang? So I recently picked up my car from a shop. It's an old car. It's like a 65 Thunderbird. And I've discovered that it gives me a buff against uh, old white men. So. Whenever I'm at a gas station filling it up, um, I get approached by them. And their first thought is, looks at me, and I can see, I can see the fucking slurs forming on their tongue. But then they look at my car, and they get the nostalgia. Because they haven't seen a car like this since they were in their, like, 20s. And they want to know where I got it, what I've done with it. They get so fucking excited that they forget to call me slurs. My car's fucking magic. Men who refer to women as females. That's gross and weird. You are a female though. This is page 45 in the book Females by Andrea Long Chu. In the United States, the man known as the father of gynecology, J. Marion Sims, built the field in the antebellum South, operating on enslaved women in his backyard, often without anesthesia or of course consent. As C. Riley Snorton has recently documented, the distinction between biological females and women as a social category, far from a neutral scientific observation, developed precisely in order for the captive black woman to be recognized as female, making Sims's research applicable to his women patients in polite white society, without being granted the status of social and legal personhood. Sex was produced, in other words, precisely at the juncture where gender was denied. In this sense, a female has always been less than a person. One unfortunate thing when I came out as non-binary is that my uterus didn't. <laughs> now, whenever I get my period, it just feels like when you keep getting texts from the same wrong number, you know? <laughs> like, dude, I promise I'm not the guy you're looking for. <laughs> I just feel like all the language around periods is so gendered, it's hard to come up with a completely genderless way to conceptualize it, you know? Like, at least if I were a dude, I think I, maybe I could get kind of macho about it. I could be like, time to blast out another would-be person. Not this time, pal. <laughs> but totally genderless? I mean, the closest I've come is like, these little eggies got a skedaddle, you know? <laughs> just assume the form of the most genderless being of all time. A middle school math teacher with fun ties. <laughs> Being transgender is a lot like you've had a rock in your shoe for your entire life. <laughs> but because you've never known life without a rock in your shoe, you don't really think much of it. You just kind of assume that everyone is a little bit uncomfortable all the time. <laughs> until one day you're talking to one of your friends and you're like, hey man, doesn't it suck that your feet hurt all the time? And he's like, uh, my feet never hurt. <laughs> it sounds like maybe you have a rock in your shoe. You should try taking the rock out of your shoe. And you're like, oh, fuck. 
I didn't even know that that was an option. <laughs> Which, uh, to be fair, is not entirely true because for years in secret on the internet, you'd been watching videos of people being like, this is what my body looks like three years after taking the rock out of my shoe. <laughs> But it's intimidating, because you have all these old people in the government who are like, if you try and take the rock out of your shoe, you're a pedophile. And we won't let you use the bathroom. <laughs> I guarantee you that a homophobic person has bought this dress and So I designed a whole bunch of subtle pride daisy stickers. And I currently have 10 different colorways and pride flags. But I did the daisy motif because it's cute, right? And so some people who might not know pride flags might just see it as a flower sticker. Last year in the fall, I was doing a pop-up at my local farmer's market and it was this big artisan event, but it wasn't queer specific. And this older couple came up to my booth and started looking at the Pride Daisy stickers. And I thought, well, maybe they're going to buy one for, you know, their queer grandson or whatever. But then they started saying things like, oh, these colors would look good on my car. So then I assumed that they obviously didn't know that they were Pride flags, even though everything else in my repertoire is queer stuff. I didn't say anything to them, but now there's an older couple driving around with a pansexual Pride Daisy on their car. Here is the other thing about constantly talking about being gay. <clears throat> Straight people don't realize how many times in casual conversation with you, they just make the assumption that everybody in the room is straight. And in those moments, I have to make a decision. Either I have to come out of the closet or I have to lock the closet. And now don't get me wrong, I didn't think I was sitting in a closet to begin with, but all these straight people just like literally built a house around me in the span of two seconds because they assumed everybody in the house was straight. And the minute that it's like, oh, they're making the assumption all of us date people of the opposite gender. I either have to step out in front of everybody and go, hey, I'm gay. Or I have to just like not say anything and let people assume that I'm somebody I'm not. And I hate coming out of the closet. It's f***ing weird. And so I would rather never be in the closet in the first place. I'm going to make it really obvious that I'm a lesbian so that you never accidentally put me in one of those really awkward scenarios. When straight people talk about the closet, they act like we built the closet that we lived in. But we didn't build it. You build it. You build it all the time, every day, when you assume everybody around you is straight. That's the closet. Here are four gender-affirming style tips for trans men. To reduce the appearance of curvy hips and thighs, you want to opt for a flat front pant with a straight leg. And although I do really like pleats, they do tend to emphasize curves and any sort of hippiness that you might have. Same thing for slim or tapered pants, sometimes they can cling too heavily to your ankle, which will just further emphasize curvy hips. Whereas a straight leg creates a nice clean line from the waist to the ankles. Tip number two is to stick to woven fabrics. Woven fabrics tend to drape and skim the body in a really flattering manner. Whereas knits tend to emphasize every lump and bump. Twill, broadcloth, and oxford cloth are all great woven fabrics that can suit any type of body. Tip number three is to embrace an overlayer. A lightweight outer layer, such as a shirt jacket or a chore jacket, is a great way to add visual bulk to the top half of your body, while also concealing parts of your body that maybe you don't want to emphasize. Tip number four is to not feel bound to the men's section. I know that this might sound a bit counterintuitive, but ultimately you want to find pieces of clothing that fit your body in a way that makes you feel comfortable. And since some of these items might not live in the men's section, explore the women's section and even the kids' section to find items that are going to suit your body best.
Oh, I came out as trans the summer before my sophomore year of high school and that year I had this teacher and his vibe was very like you know when there's like a teacher in high school and they will randomly drop an f-bomb while they're teaching and so it makes all the kids in their class like this guy gets it like he fucking relates to us as teenagers and like he's fucking chill I literally fucked with him so this is the beginning of the year like I had just come out as trans I was dealing with some backlash that was just making my life not the most comfortable but I'm in his class and we're going through this packet that's like all of these like moral dilemmas like these discussion questions and so I'm sitting there the little gay fucker in the corner looking through it we flip to this page and this page for the class discussion was like questioning the morality of gender reassignment surgeries like questioning whether insurances should cover it and compared gender reassignment surgeries to like getting a nose job and so i was like okay i'm just gonna be a bystander and watch this shit fucking go down and i'm sitting there this man cool guy on campus walks over to my fucking desk and he looks at me and i'm looking at him i'm like hello and he goes so Sasha, why don't you give us your thoughts on this? So, because can, can, can you defend that trans surgeries are should be covered? Because you can can you even can you even defend that trans people are real? Can you even defend that being transgender is a real thing? It's like this is not fucking happening to me right now. He's like, because that that would be the only way that the, the, the surgeries would be justifiable to be sure and covered by insurance. So like, can you justify that it's a real thing? So I'm shitting my pants because I'm in front of this whole class. Like I don't want to fucking do this. Why are you making me do this, Mr. Sal? You know what I'm dealing with. So I looked at him in silence for a long time. I'm sitting there in my gay little button up, and I'm like, uh. I said we're not gonna do this right now and he was like no but explain why the and i was like we're not gonna do this right now it's just so fucking funny i don't know why that was my response i literally went full guidance counselor mode on his ass we're not gonna do this right now okay anyways it was awkward as fuck and we stood there looking at each other until he like turned away and continued the class discussion that is my example of how when you come out it literally changes your entire view of the world because the people that you thought were cool and normal and nice and like regular members of society are actually freaky weirdos and if you come out and that happens to you take a dump on your desk and leave walk out So I've been seeing a lot of uh, TikToks talking about the, it's under the sound, the oh cis hetero, the cis um, gamer boyfriend who thought he was straight until he met his uh, non-binary, you know, whatever, and like, it's a queer relationship and yada 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 bullshit. And it reminds me of this time where, oh shit, hold on. So I used to work at Metro by T-Mobile, right? And, or Metro PCS. And I remember how one time um, I had these two co-workers, they were best friends. And they were exactly what you imagine. They were the exact, like, cis gamer boyfriends that everyone loves, whatever, whatever. They, like, dropped out of art school, and they were working on an 8-bit game. Very dorky, very cute, tall and white. And I remember one time the conversation came up that, like, whether or not they were single or something, I asked them something like that. And they were like, oh, um, no, you know, we have um, significant others. They said girlfriends, but they, you know, whatever. And I was like, oh, what are their names? And they're like, oh, their name's Bailey and Jared. And I was sitting here, I was like, oh, um, sorry, a really cute girl just, like, walked by. It was crazy. So anyway, I was like, oh, um, those seem like pretty mass names to me. So I was like, oh, that's crazy. And they're like, oh, yeah, no, they're, like, they're trans non-binary, whatever, whatever. And at the time, I was really young. So I was sitting there, I was like, trans non-binary, like, oh, so they must be, like, trans women. And they were like, oh, like, no, 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 no. Like, I mean, you know, um, they're non-binary, but, like, the parts match up and i was like the parts line up like what's that supposed to mean again i'm really young i'm like what the hell does that mean and it wasn't until i actually met jared and bailey that i saw what they saw which were two women they saw like two women um and they were you know they were very femme presenting and cutesy one of them was white and it made me realize that a lot of your boyfriends not all but a lot don't see you as what you are they don't see non-binary and in private they're very easily going to say what what they what they want to mean and what the world to see. They want the world to see a straight relationship and they're going to try and make sure everyone sees that in private. Lucky for Jared and Bailey, that relationship, both of those relationships didn't last, so. 
Hi, my name is Madeline English and I'm a queer historian. And today we are going to be talking about the queer history of Texas. So before the colonization of Texas happened, native people lived in communities full of gender fluid people. Throughout the Southwest, indigenous children with gender fluid identities were nurtured and grew to become important members of the community. And this wasn't just in the Southwest, it was through a lot of native communities. But because I'm talking about Texas, I am kind of focusing on the Southwest. Um, in West Texas, Apache communities included individuals known as I'm not going to try to say this because I feel like I would butcher it and I really don't want to do that and like offend this entire community of amazing people. Um, so I'm going to put it right here. If somebody could please teach me the pronunciation, that would be great. But it roughly translates to man woman. Um, and in Karankawa communities, trans women were embraced and referred to as Again, please, somebody teach me. Um, and all along the Gulf Coast, gender fluid people occupied important roles such as knowledge keepers, medicine people, and spiritual leaders. In the early 1500s, the Cuchindado people of the southwestern Texas region lived in tight-knit communities, and these communities included both cis and transgender people. However, by the late 1520s, Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca led Spanish conquistadors through the Caribbean and into the mainland Americas. And when he got to Texas, he wrote of, quote, a devilish thing. The legal mechanism the Spanish used to terrorize native people was known as El Recuerimiento, written by the Council of Castile and first issued in 1513. And it demanded that indigenous people renounce their religious beliefs, accept Catholicism, and submit to Spanish rule or be subject to war, slavery, or death. I think it's important when we talk about states like Texas that we do have to acknowledge that queer people have always been here. And despite what our governor may want us to believe about queer people or gender nonconforming people, we have always been here. And it's important to talk about and to honor those people who came before us. Because if we don't do it now, then when will we? And I do want to add one more thing. If you're from Texas, especially the Corpus area like I am, I would look up the Ennis Jocelyn burial ground, which is under the Ennis Jocelyn Road, which is, a, if you don't know, it's a five lane road in Corpus Christi, stretching from the Oso Bay to Ocean Drive to SBID. It's like a huge road. And um, they recently found a massive burial site for indigenous peoples, and they refuse to honor it and give it that space that it needs to allow the community to heal. Um, so yeah, that's why it's important to talk about history. So there's two ideas getting conflated here. There's the idea of gender roles or gender norms and the idea of the gender binary. Let's talk about gender norms and gender roles first. So gender roles are just the social expectations that are culturally significant to a person, meaning there's a bunch of different cultures around the world and all these different cultures define gender on their own term. And with that comes a particular set of expectations based on what gender you are, right? So I grew up in a biracial home, so I have, that ex I have some examples from my real life. My dad, right, he's French. When he was a kid growing up, he was taught that his place as a man was to be strong, was to protect his family, to work hard, to make money, to do hard physical labor, that he would be that person who's supposed to know how to fix things around the house, right? But that he should never wash dishes, cook food, you know, like that that was women's work, sewing women's work, right? All these things are specifically women's work. Now my mom, she's Cameroonian, in her family and her cultural upbringing, her brothers weren't raised like that. Her brothers were raised to be protective, right? They were raised to be strong, to know how to fix things. But they were also raised to cook, to clean, to do all the things that are included in care work in the home. Those things were not specifically gendered for men or women. So that's why today, even though my uncles are men and my dad is a man, my dad can't cook and my uncles can because they had different expectations in their respective cultures about the role that they had as a man. And that's not to say that one is necessarily better than the other or that every single person who fits a particular gender is going to act according to their cultural gender roles. But those roles are basically what's expected. Then people can choose to fit or not fit within that. And often, you know, when they decide to not go with that they'll face violence they'll you know they'll be repressed now when i talk about the gender binary what i'm really talking about is the european gender binary which upholds a specific set of gender norms right specific set of gender roles that was taken from europe and then exported through colonization missionaries etc which is why i say that it's oppressive that we have to deal with the gender binary. It's because the gender binary really wasn't created with black and brown people in mind. 
Now, why would men and women of color uphold those specific gender roles, like the European gender roles? Most of the time is because we've been colonized. Like that's literally the reason. The other answer is basically assimilation, right? If you live in a majority white place or if you live in a place where there's white privilege, where there's white power, it makes sense that you would conform to the gender norms of the dominant culture around. But sometimes people of color's culture and their gender norms actually kind of match, right? Like I said, my uncles were also taught to be protective, just like my dad. That was already something that existed in both cultures to begin with. Does that make sense? I hope it makes sense. So, so this is what I don't understand. What I don't understand is why uh, white, gender nonconforming, and trans people could conceptualize their own transition as something that has an impact on other people on a systemic level. Like, I don't understand how you transition and then you feel like that in of itself is transgressive to the point that it's disrupting the status quo. Maybe y'all can help me make sense of that. But this is what I'll say, right? I think this comment kind of harks back to an idea of existence as resistance, which is an idea I've been exposed to before. But I will say that I was initially exposed to that idea from a very, very black lens, like very black revolutionary, black liberatory kind of politic. And, you know, with that politic in mind, the idea of existence as resistance acknowledges the fact that to, that to exist in a black body in a white supremacist society is to be constantly under attack, right? Is to be attacked in every way, medically, educationally, financially, socially, physically, mentally, emotionally, like you're constantly under attack. And so to survive that, right? And to help other people around you survive that, your family members, your community members, right? Other black people is to support resistance movements, whether you care to or not, right? Because ultimately like white supremacy wants you unalived. And so if we're still surviving as a people, then like we're doing something that actively is like harming white supremacy. But notice how part of that, right? That acknowledgement is acknowledging the labor that is invested and that's involved in maintaining each other and keeping each other alive. Meaning that's like a single mom who has to work three jobs to keep her children in school, right? To make sure that her kids have everything that they need. It's that same mom, you know, volunteering at the local soup kitchen or maybe taking care of a sick elder relative, right? Like there's a lot of labor involved in that process and there's a lot of care la labor that's spread across a whole entire community. I have a problem with white queers aligning themselves with that kind of logic because as somebody who's supposedly in community with y'all, I ain't never seen y'all actually really support, protect and care for black and brown people, particularly black and brown trans and gender nonconforming people. And listen, like a great example of that is that whole monkeypox thing in New York City where like there were vaccines available in a black and brown community and somehow it was all white men who ended up like snack, like, you know, getting all the, the appointments to get that vaccine, right? Like those white queer men were not invested in protecting and prioritizing the protection of the black and brown folks whose spots they were taking. And this is a regular occurrence. Like black and brown people observe white queers do shit like this all the time. And that's why if you go to the Comment section in the original video you'll see that a lot of us are expressing distrust because we don't feel seen we don't feel protected we don't feel in community we don't feel like acknowledged by y'all at all so you can kick and scream but that's how we feel have you watched all these videos about like resonance vocal fold mass pitch all the stuff and you're like god i just this all this doesn't make sense and it doesn't work well i've got good news and bad news the good news is I got the answer for you. The bad news is what I'm about to share with you, you are most likely taking for granted. You do this every single day. You might think it's easy and therefore you don't think it's really all that important. So what is it? Why can't you get it? Well, my darlings, you need to learn about breath. So if you just didn't scroll away when I said breath, then you're here because you actually want to change your voice, not because you want a shortcut. So to be really brief, I need to explain what resonance is. Resonance is space. The more space we have, the darker the sound, the less space we have, the brighter the sound. But when we create less space, that puts a lot of back pressure on our voice. And herein lies the crux of trans feminine voice training. The reason that it is so hard 
for countless trans women to change their voice is because when you shrink the voice and you don't apply the airflow, the voice just is this nasally mush of sound. That's the technical term. So do an exercise for me real quick. I would like you to imagine that you are blowing a bug off of the screen. <laughs> now, alternatively, I want you to think about fogging up a window in front of you. <sighs> Pause the video and do that a few times. What you should have noticed is that the breath in the bug blowing had a lot more resistance. You had to work harder to get that airflow out compared to where you're fogging up the window. The airflow didn't have resistance. It was just falling out. You ran out of breath quicker and you like could barely sustain, you could barely support the breath. So resonance the same way, only now we apply a sound to that breath. So in this way, we take that nee sound really nasally, really bright, the brighter, the better. And where you used your diaphragm a moment to push that airflow out, what I want you to do is take that diaphragm and make that nasally sound breathy. This is really hard. This is not easy. You most likely will not get this on the first try. Nee. And in fact, I didn't even do it right on the first try. Did you notice how the first one I let the resonance go? I let the resonance go because it was easier. The second one, I did it right. It was harder. I had to work harder for it. Practice. I am going to say this once, and I'm not going to say it nice, so buckle up to sit in your discomfort or save it and come back later. If you are not a lesbian and you are not a trans man, and you have made it your business to come on God's green internet to criticize members of these two groups to which you do not belong for being in loving consensual relationships with one another, I strongly suggest that you shut the hell your mouth. When you see queer people doing queer things and you find yourself confused and uncomfortable, it is okay to simply remain confused and uncomfortable. You don't have to make it their problem. And if you would like to understand how it is possible for a trans man and a lesbian to find a loving relationship with one another, it will behoove you to listen to the voices of trans men and lesbians in loving relationships with one another. But again, you don't have to understand. And if you are doing this out of some false sense of saviorism, or perhaps a very real concern about a very real problem, which is TERFs who are lesbians chasing trans men and trying to convert them back to lesbianism, it would behoove you to actually listen to the trans men who are already speaking on that issue, rather than speaking over them to tell them that they're not allowed to be loved. But you don't actually care about trans men, do you? Or you wouldn't be infantilizing them with the suggestion that, as a group, they're not capable of discerning when someone is fetishizing them or when someone they're interested in dating is actually transphobic. Because let's be real, none of the people who are criticizing this relationship type are suggesting that the trans man is at fault for what is wrong with it. It is once again just the beloved old concept of lesbians being predatory, that we are somehow forcing trans men into relationships with us. Lesbians and trans men do not owe digestible concepts of our identities to other queer people. We use reductive, pithy, simplistic phrases for political power. Phrases like, trans men are men, lesbians are not attracted to men. These statements are true enough in the context of the cis-heteropatriarchy that they're meaningful to help us get human rights. We use the phrase trans men are men to help combat transphobia. We use the phrase lesbians are not attracted to men to help combat misogyny and homophobia. But in our community, we don't have to live by pithy, simplistic phrases. Our identities are complex, vast, expansive, and beautiful. They do not have to be subject to simple math. And if you, a queer person, are trying to force other queer people to be more digestible to the cis-heteropatriarchy, ask yourself why. Now, if you are a lesbian who is not attracted to trans men and does not consider attraction to trans men to be part of your identity, or a trans man who is not attracted to lesbians and would not consider a relationship with a lesbian to be valid in your identity, and you would like to understand others in your community who feel differently from you, I would suggest building community with others in your community who feel different from you. Also some reading.
Okay, how will you enforce this? If you want to kick out trans men from lesbian spaces, you're going to figure out who to kick out. Is it anyone with facial hair? Anyone who uses he, him pronouns? Anyone who wears men's clothes? Anyone who has top surgery? Anyone with an M marker on their driver's license? Anyone who passes as a man at work, at school, in public, for safety? Are you going to measure how much testosterone is in their system? Are you going to ask them which parts of their body cause dysphoria? Are you going to ask them what's in their pants? Is it anyone who likes to be called husband or boyfriend? Is it anyone who uses masculine terms of address? Is it anyone who likes to be called daddy in bed? Is it anyone who has gone through the experience of social and or medical transition and wants to use the word trans man to refer to the lived experience they have to find community and access resources that they need as a trans person? Or is it okay if he refers to that but he has to use the word trans mask because that's less scary to you? How much man is too much man for you? Where do you draw the line? And why do you get to decide on behalf of someone else what resources they need access to? You, someone I can easily assume is not visibly trans, what is your idea of what a lesbian is allowed to look like, act like? And why are you the authority? And let's talk about why lesbians need safe spaces for men. What is the number one reason that lesbians don't want men in our spaces? It is because of actual violence. Because they harass us, fetishize us, rope us, and grape us. Because they are our oppressors, right? Well, if you want to talk about actual violence in the gender binary, let's look at some statistics. I'll give you a moment. That's right. Trans men are four and a half times as likely to experience actual violence than cis women. And let's not play coy. We know who the perpetrator is in all those cases. So if anyone needs a space safe from cis men, it's trans men more than you. Trans people deserve access to whatever safe space they decide they need. When you punish people in the lesbian community for exploring trans masculinity, you're not keeping us safe from men. You're just punishing trans people for being trans. And make no mistake, this sentiment is not just identity discourse. The idea that there is something innate about men that makes them violent is the exact root of radfam ideology. The idea that there's something about men that makes them grapists. There is nothing natural about grape. The men who hurt us do so because they want to, and they can. And that's it. It's not because of their biology, it's not because of their socialization, it's not because of their gender. It's because they can get away with it. Because they're rewarded for it. And this searching for something about men to blame, all this does is excuse men for the violence they perpetrate. And punish all trans people simply for existing. You've just discovered turfdom from another angle. Don't go down that path. Trans men are not our brothers. They are our brothers, our allies, and our friends.